Hey folks, welcome back to the Arkansas Soybean Promotion Board Soybean Podcast. We've got Dr. Jeremy Ross here today, University of Arkansas Extension Soybean Agronomist. We've got a couple of projects that we talked about uh, last year. So what's been happening with those since we talked last time? So if we're talking about the tech transfer project, um, that one is to really disseminate information out to the growers uh, in the state and, and region. So we look at using that to publish our soybean research series. Uh, that's a good reference for not only you know researchers in the future on looking at you know what's been done in Arkansas, uh, but it also gives farmers opportunity to you know kind of see you know what research is going on in the state. The other components of that tech transfer project is uh, publishing the variety information that we do every year. So the soybean update, the metribuzin screening, cross-reference guide. And then this past year, uh, we actually started putting together a, a flood tolerant publication. And so that's uh, hand-selected hand varieties from different companies. Um, and we put on a, a flood you know, early in the season. And that gives uh, farmers a little bit of indication on what varieties can withstand flood better than, than some of the others. So, so that new flood tolerant study, that's in addition to the 200 varieties you were testing before? Right, yeah, so that's a subset, you know, so individual companies, you know, elect to put, you know, their varieties into right. that flood okay. study. So it's it's over and above the varieties the, that are tested in the OVT. Okay. And, you know, we've actually got, you know, the OVT here at the Newport Station. Uh, walked it last week, it looked really good. So I'm hoping we get some really good data out of it. And then the, the last component of the tech transfer uh, project is the helping to host the, the Tri-State Soybean Forum that we have every year in January uh, between Arkansas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. So that's usually a good good kickoff for the season, yeah. you know, uh, get some really good uh, soybean talks, you know, just a soybean only meeting. Right. And we get, you know, try to get speakers from all three states to come in and, and talk about things that are going on. The meeting season is a good time for attendance. Right? It is, you know, and that's that's usually the first meeting of the season because it's usually the first Friday of, of January. So, uh, right right after Christmas uh, break, and and just to kind of get a good start to the season. So, the other umbrella project is there. I know you've got some new stuff too because you know we 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 do our level best to try to get you early. This happens. It's very <laughs> ambitious. We talk about it at the funding meeting every year. We're going to talk to Jeremy Ross in March. And then we talked to Jeremy Ross in August, September, because I know you get busy. I saw your calendar. It's, it's a mess. But you always bring something new um, as the year goes on. So underneath your other funded project, what's going on there? So under the Emerging Production Systems uh, project, so that's, again, kind of an umbrella project. And so we've got a really good, strong extension soybean agronomist group. Um, you know, if you're, you're online and you Google Science for Success, that's the, the kind of the title that we have for our group. You know, we all can, you know, typically do research in our own states, but, you know, sometimes it, you know, we really don't get a whole lot of, of data, you know, to look at that. And so we uh, decided to, as a group to look at these, you know, collaborative projects and have, you know, common treatments across, you know, multiple states. And so, uh, you know, we've done some on uh, foliar feeds that we completed uh, a year ago. And so this was, again, you know, looking at, you know, not having any kind of deficiencies, but, you know, as a supplement to our normal fertility program. And we really didn't see that big of an impact with that. Um, this year, or well, last year, we started looking at a nitrogen sulfur study uh, that uh, kind of started in uh, Kansas State. Um, this is the second year for that. Uh, we've got it at two different locations, one here at, or at the Newport Station or the Jackson County Extension Center, and then the second location is at our Kibler location uh, up in you know, north, northwest Arkansas. Main reason we went up there because we wanted to try to find a location where we would see a, a, a response to nitrogen and sulfur. A little bit more sandy uh, location compared to the rest of the stations we have in the state. So uh, plots look really good so far this year. Uh, all the treatments have been applied, you know, and now we're just kind of waiting, you know, for the, the soybeans to dry down so we can harvest. 
And then the one project we did start this year, and we've got about 16 or 17 states involved in this, is looking at uh, biological products because that's been a big push over the last several years. A lot of companies are getting into the biological market. Mm -hmm. And so we've got 10 different products that we looked at. Uh, all of them were seed treatments. Um, you know, walking the plots, I really haven't seen much of a difference so far this year. Um, you know, there's really no visual, but again, you know, the, the test is going to be, you know, at harvest Yield, and, yeah. and looking at the yield. So uh, really excited about that. We're working on, you know, uh, for next year, uh, we just had a meeting in Minnesota two weeks ago and talking about some other projects that we're kind of looking down the line. So one of the po potential is looking at um, soil health. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's the big buzzword, you know, the last several years. And uh, we're looking at it in soybean yields and seeing if we can, you know, do any kind of correlation with soil health and, and soybean yields, so. How does data from Minnesota apply here outside of soil health? Well, you know, so, you know, that, that several people have asked that question, you know, you know, you know, we grow soybeans in the Mid-South and it's nowhere like growing soybeans, you know, in Minnesota, Michigan, you know, Iowa, Ohio, you know, if you just look and, you know, soybeans and soybeans, mm -hmm. you know, if, uh, you know, if we can get a large pool of data and if we compare, you know, data from the Mid-South versus data to the, you know, the Midwest, and we're really not seeing any kind of impact with any kind of treatment across the, you know, multiple locations, different environments, that's just going to tell us that, you know, hey, you know, this, this may not be working. Right. And so, you know, we're, we're trying to be that unbiased source of information and trying to test, you know, things that producers are getting, you know, asked to put out. Right. And so we want to make sure that, you know, the practices and the products that the farmers are using are actually going to be able to make them a, a return on their investment. And so even though a lot of the times, you know, a lot of the research is not that flashy mm -hmm. and we really don't see that big a impact, you know, or any impact, you know, from the treatments with on yield, you know, farmers need to know that. Does that fall under the, this push for biologicals treatments? I know you're talking about seed treatments, but is that, you know, finding a natural pathogen right. in, in, in the wild that can help some of this pigweed pressure? You know, I think it was, it's in the kind of the same uni universe, mm -hmm. but you know, when we're talking about what Dr. Bloom's doing is looking for a fungi or, or a disease that's going to specifically attack, you know, the, the Palmer amaranth. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that would just be another tool in our tool chest to help combat, you know, Palmer amaranth and pigweed uh, infestations. But, you know, the, <clears throat> the products we're looking at, you know, there's a lot of the claim is, you know, helping to increase nutrient uptake or they're adding some uh, additional nutrients by, you know, nitrogen fixation or uh, their, the mycelium of the fungi are able to explore the smaller nooks and crannies that the roots of the soybean plant can't get into and so they're extracting those nutrients and so, uh, you know, or, or, or some plant health, you know, benefits. And so, again, you know, a lot of companies are looking at these products, you know, again, you know, if, if I looked at, you know, all the products on the market, it'd probably take the rest of my career, you know, just, <laughs> right. to, just to look at them just because of the number. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, again, we're kind of doing this widespread, you know, project with, you know, similar treatments just to try to get as much data uh, that we can to try to see, you know, our, you know, our goal is maybe, you know, we can find something that actually works. And, you know, if there is something out there that, you know, is going to give farmers a return on their investment, you know, we're going to be the ones, you know, shouting it from the, right. from the rooftops. Game changer. Yep. Is there anything on the technology front that you're excited about or have any hope for? So, you know, probably the, the biggest thing is, uh, you know, the use of drones. You know, we're starting to see more and more of that. And I think uh, we've got several, you know, faculty members looking at that. Uh, you know, Tommy Butts has, has got one and looking at, you know, weed control with it. Uh, Jason Davis is doing a lot on technology, looking at drones and, 
uh, looking at you know potentially getting one of these that we can spray with you know and, and yeah. looking at applications I know there's um, a, a company here in state that's been kind of doing a little bit of that this year uh, Terry Spurlock has been working with drones and he's probably a big, knows a big fan. Yeah. more about drones than anybody else in the system um, but you know he's doing some really neat stuff on you know fungicide application and then flying a drone and looking at different you know sensors and different things trying to identify and so you know I, I think drones are going to be you know a big part um, you know probably eventually every farmer is probably going to have one in the back of their truck and they'll stop and you know right send it off and let it fly over a field I and mean, they can you know see if there's any kind of especially under you know wind damage or right. or any kind of if you know your irrigation water is not making it down certain furrows yep. or things like that, as opposed to taking you know an hour to walk to across walk a it. field, I agree with you. I think you can spend, be... send it up and you yep. know a matter of just a few minutes, kind of see you know what's going on. Um, the sea and spray uh, technology with John Deere uh, looks interesting. Um, you know, Dr. Uh, Jason Norsworthy and Tommy Tommy Butts and Tom Barber have looked at that over the last several years. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's going to be a fit in certain certain areas, uh, just like with any other technology. I think there's going to be that learning curve. Yeah, like you said, it's very specific at that point. Right. It's going to wind up spraying the majority of the time. But it's but you know, again, I think it's just going to be another tool. Uh, we may be able to save a little bit, you know, on some of those applications. Probably the next thing is probably irrigation technology. I think we're seeing more and more use of the sensors okay. and being a little bit more. Uh, exact on when we need to irrigate and saving right. money on that. It's become more and, competitive in the marketplace too in terms of product offering. Yep. So, and that's a easy sell too because it's just more efficient. I mean, moving water is terribly expensive. Oh, it is. Um, time consuming. Um, you know, this year's turning out pretty good. I was a little concerned early on, but you know, right now USDA has this pegged to a new state record at 53 bushels per acre. That's up by uh, one and a half, Two, right? uh, about two, yeah, yeah okay, I two. think. Last year we were 51, yeah, okay. so that's, that's almost right. two bushels. Um, you know, we're probably gonna have more irrigations this year than the last several years just because of the, the drought conditions. But, um, you know, two bushels better than what we've ever been. You know, that's a pretty lofty goal. Yeah. But, you know, it's potentially we could. We got some really good beans and some really tall beans out there, but then also we got some that just don't look too good. Right. So. Yeah, you get some mixed bag this year. All right. Well, thanks again for your time yep. today. I appreciate it as usual. And uh, drop me a pin to that dove field when we shoot this weekend. <laughs> thanks for listening to the Arkansas Soybean Promotion Board's Soybean Podcast. We hope you'll follow us on Twitter at Arkansas Soybean and even more resources at themiraclebean.com.